Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Thankful to be in the service tonight. We're glad to see each one that's here. We're going to read tonight from Acts chapter 7. We'll begin in verse 54 all the way in the end. We're looking at a particular time, I guess, here. This is the account of Stephen. Uh, we're picking up reading here in verse 54 right after Stephen has preached this message that he preached to the Sanhedrin Council, which is a uh, very interesting study if you, if you look at what Stephen preached. It's, I, I often uh, wonder how much it affected Paul and uh, a lot of what Stephen taught even here right before the Sanhedrin Council is some of the things, same things that you see in the beginning of the book of Hebrews. And uh, it's very interesting when you tie those, some of those things together. Uh, verse 54, again, is where we pick up reading. This is, we're, we're reading the consequences, what happened just after Stephen got through talking. Verse 54, it says, And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now I'm going to stop reading there with verse 60. Uh, this is, to me, a, a, a very interesting account in the Scripture because we see something here that I think is, goes very much against our human nature, goes very much against how we would naturally conduct ourselves. Uh, it goes against how, you know, our, our, it goes very much against the grain. I'll say it that way. Uh, we tend to be people who think justly. We uh, think about justice a lot. We want justice. You see something bad happen, you want justice. You see a, a crime committed, we want justice until something happens to us and we want mercy. And uh, that's oftentimes the way we think. Unless, of course, then we've been wrongly accused. If we've been wrongly accused, then we seek justice. The Bible and I've often mentioned this, and it's something that we need to always bear in our minds. The Bible does not have very good things to say about us, naturally speaking. The Bible does not, uh, does not praise humanity for its well service to the Lord and for all the good things that humanity does. That's, that's not what the Bible does. The Bible tells us the truth about ourselves. And the truth is often hard to hear. And that's what's going on here uh, with these individuals. We can look at what they're, at what they're doing. And they're, uh, the Bible says, I'm, I'll just tell you what I, what I see. Uh, these men are acting like a bunch of children. And uh, they stop their ears up. Now you think about that. When Stephen is making the statements that he made. And then he, he it's made the statement that, he, he saw verse 56, it said, And behold, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing in the right hand of God. And they cried, and this, notice verse 57, Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. I mean, literally. They're, they're, you remember when you used to do that as a kid? You'd plug your ears up and you'd holler because you didn't want to hear what somebody else was saying. I mean, that's, that's the childish nature that you're dealing with. But it's human nature. And there's sometimes that even today when somebody begins to tell you something you don't want to hear, you want to plug your ears up and you want, to, you want to go yelling, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it, don't tell me that. We have a difficult time seeing ourselves for who we really are. 
We have a difficult time. And sometimes we want to see things justly and we think we want to see justice. We think we want to see things justly until we take a moment to look at ourselves and then it's, no, I don't want justice anymore. Uh, I, I, I believe it, I heard it stated this way, it's pretty funny to me. Uh, there was a, a photographer one day taking a bunch of pictures and a fellow kept coming back to him kind of aggravated with the way the photographer was doing, you know, and he was like, well, you know, these, these pictures is just not turning out right, you know. These things aren't turning out right. We need you to take them again. We need you to do it right, you know, take these pictures. And finally he came back and he was like, these pictures are not doing me justice. And the photographer had gotten fed up with it. He said, with a face like that, you don't need justice. You need mercy. Okay? That's kind of where we are. All right? We look at ourselves spiritually in the mirror. We're seeing, and the Bible is showing us, a picture of who we are. And justice is not usually what we desire to see we, when, you know, it, it, we need not justice, we need mercy. And so the Bible shows us that. The Bible shows us who we are. The Bible shows us that truthful picture of ourselves that we would seek God for mercy. Okay? So the Bible shows us that picture of ourselves. Stephen here is doing that very thing. And these men are not taking it very well. These men are not receiving what Stephen has to say. The Bible, and, and, and look, the truth hurts. The, the truth, and it doesn't just hurt y'all, it hurts me too. The truth hurts everybody. There are times, and I, I try to, I always try to listen when someone has something to say. I try to be one to, to take constructive criticism. Have y'all ever had constructive criticism it's it's a good thing if you listen to it if you will hear it constructive criticism will help you and there are people who uh will, will give us constructive criticism and there's some when I first surrendered to preach that they would come to me and they would give me constructive con uh, criticism and it was it was difficult and uh you know there, there were times that it I didn't receive it well. I did a good, pretty good job of not letting them know that. But I didn't receive it well. But often what I would do is I would try my best not to be offended at them and hear what they have to say. Even in the moment, go back and let me go back and think about it. Let me go back and chew on it. And did, did they have a valid point? Okay. It, but the, the point is this, the truth is very difficult, and the Bible understands that. The truth is offensive. And so the, Jesus made the statement himself that he didn't come to bring peace but a sword. What does he mean by that? That the word of God is offensive. It hurts. It cuts. And so these men, the first thing that we read, that, that they were cut to the heart by the words that Stephen had said. Now, it's interesting that, they, that the Bible uses this. They were cut to the heart. And I think even you go on over it and the statement is made about Saul that it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I think Paul was convicted here. And I think Paul continued to be convicted by the message that Stephen preached. And it was very difficult. The Bible has a lot of things to say about how we are supposed to receive the Word of God. That's why we have our hearts prepared. The only way the truth offends us is if we're prideful. I'll just say that. The only way the truth offends us is if we're prideful. If we're not prideful and we're humble, then the truth is not going to offend us. We'll find it greatly helpful and very useful, and we'll move on from that, apply it as we need to apply it. So when we find ourselves in a place where we receive the truth and we're offended by it, the only reason we're offended is because of our pride. Uh, so that it, it's something that's difficult. But I want to take a moment to look at Stephen's attitude. To look at Stephen's attitude. Because it is, it, it is completely against human nature. These men rip Stephen out of the city. Just, just jerk him out of the city. Take him down outside the city and stone him. Which was not a very pretty process if you study that. Stoning was a very difficult, very gruesome thing. That basically they're beating a person to death with rocks. By throwing them 
uh, oftentimes, if, if uh, my study is correct, they would bury a person to some degree where they couldn't move and would just beat them and with, with stones. And so you can imagine kind of some idea about what's going on in this picture. And then Stephen, as this process is happening, sees Jesus and, you know, the, even, even the more they, they uh, begin to stone him. And the Bible says that he, as this is happening, that he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The only time that we ever see this, other than this one particular point, is at the cross where Jesus made the statement that, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. As Jesus is being crucified and put to death, he seeks the forgiveness for these men. Jesus forgives them of what they're doing to him in that very moment. Now we say, well, that's, that's Christ. You know, he's, he's the Son of God. And, and yet, you know, there's, that's, that's, in other words, that's kind of, that's next level spirituality. You know, I ain't got to that place yet. That's, that's, that's the next level. I, I, I hadn't got there. But then you see Stephen do the same thing. And it's okay, then it, that Stephen obviously is not the Christ. He's not the Son of God. But certainly he's being affected by the Son of God. He's got the Spirit and he, he's grown. He's matured to the place that even as these men are killing him, he forgives them. So the question that I want to ask tonight, I want to present a little bit about forgiveness. But how can we have a heart like Stephen that we could forgive others around us? To such a degree that we would be willing to forgive them even when they're set out to destroy us. How can we do that? So I want to give you kind of a, 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 some ideas about forgiveness tonight. To get us to thinking about Stephen and about what was taking, what was taking place at this particular time. All right. The first thing that I want to mention is that when we begin to find ourselves in a situation, when we find ourselves in a place where people are stoning us to a degree, maybe obviously not literally speaking, but they are with their words, and that what they are doing is literally trying to assault us. And that we may have nothing more in our minds than to do exactly what God's called us to do. We may have nothing more in our minds but complete sincerity and the best of intentions in doing what we're trying to do. And not only the best intentions, we may be to the place that we're doing exactly what God's asked us to do. And people are still attempting to take us down. That's the case, and that happens a lot. That happens in church work. And one of the reasons that happens is that the devil is doing everything that he can to tear us apart. And so he is pitting us, as that's one of the things that the devil does, is he pits us one against another. And so don't find it odd today that when you begin to do something for the Lord and you find yourself being effective for the Lord, somebody tries to tear you down. Don't find that, don't, don't let that surprise you. In fact, what you should do is expect it because it's coming. And sometimes it might be surprising the area or the direction from which it comes. But don't let that surprise you. Now, what do you do? The first thing that I want you to do when you find yourself in that position is to consider the adversary. And I'm not just speaking of Satan, but to consider 
the heart of the ones who are attempting to tear you down. Uh, consider the heart of the ones who are attempting to stone you with their words. Think on them. Think about them. What are, what are they trying to do? Sometimes we find ourselves in situations. Now, uh, it, it, in a church, it should be, and, and often is, it should be much like a family. Because that's, that's what we are. We are a family. And so I, I think about it from those terms. How often is it that we find ourselves as a family in the midst of a stressful situation Things are, things are going on, and, and maybe things are good. Maybe we're working towards an end, and, and we're beginning to be effective, or whatever, whatever. maybe something good is coming. And uh, we, we find ourselves in a situation where we're suddenly at each other's throat. Or maybe it's the case that you didn't intend to end up in a situation where you're fighting as a family, but something has come up and it's been escalated to the place that that, that, that it's almost it's blown out of portion, uh, proportion. And one of, the, one of the things that's interesting to me is sometimes you get to fight in a, in a family and you go back and you're like, what, what are we fighting about? What, what is this? And then you boil it down and you're like, this, this is not even worth fighting about. But if we could stop for a moment to consider the intentions of others. One of the things that I have to remind myself of is what is my wife, what, is my, what are my children's intentions? Are they really out to get me? Sometimes we think like that, don't we? Maybe not necessarily in a family, but we think like that in church, don't we? Somebody's out to get me. Somebody's out to tear me down. Someone's out to hurt me. When we begin to think that way, we're automatically set on guard against that individual. And that's one of the things that Satan does is sets us on guard against each other, and we begin to put up these walls. And so before a person ever even begins to interact with us, we're already guarded. And so one of the things that we need to do is consider the other person's intentions so that we tear those walls down. Maybe they're not out to get me. And even if they are out to get me, they can't do anything that God doesn't allow them to do. And it's amazing what will happen and what God can do when you just Tear those walls down. And say, if you, want to ha if you want to tear me up, tear me up. Here I am. I'll take it. But we have to let go of who we are. You see, forgiveness is so much about us and less about the other person. Forgiveness has far more to do with our pride that it has to do with what other individuals are really trying to do. And so I think one thing that Stephen is doing in this moment is he's considering these men and what they are doing. And like Christ, Christ made this statement, Father, forgive them for what? They know not what they do. That's what he's saying. They don't know what they're doing. And so Christ is considering the heart. And not only is Christ considering the heart, Christ, Christ knows for a fact what's going on in their mind. Christ knew their intentions, and he knew they did not understand what they were doing. In the same way, Stephen understood. He may not have known exactly what these men were thinking in the terms of what Christ did, but he considered the intentions of these men, and he said they don't know what they're doing. They think they're doing the right thing. And so, Father, lay not this into their charge. 
Rather, we should find compassion for them that their eyes could be opened that they see the truth. That's, you see, that's the way that we come to the terms when Jesus makes the statement that we pray for our enemies. You can't pray for your enemies in a natural mindset. You have to think about it from a spiritual perspective. You have to consider your enemies. That the reason that they are your enemies is because they are the enemy of God. And that oh, if they could just know the Lord Jesus Christ, they wouldn't be your enemy anymore. And so we have to consider their spiritual condition, and I believe that's what Stephen is doing. It's first and foremost to consider their spiritual condition. So I'm going to ask you a few questions about forgiveness for just a few more moments and try to wrap it up. So I want you to think about some things about forgiveness. And when you're thinking about forgiveness, stop thinking about the person that you are forgiving and start thinking about yourself. Because I've heard quite a few things of people come to me and they say, what am I supposed to do when X, Y, Z happens and all of this is taken to me? This is my past. This is what has happened to me. And this is what went on when I was a kid and all of these kind of things. What am I supposed to do? Forgive them. How could you expect? I don't expect anything. I'm telling you what God expects. And I'm not telling you what God expects. I'm telling you what God commands to forgive. God commands us to forgive. Why? How much do you believe that your unforgiveness, if I may put it in those terms, affects the person that you haven't forgiven? How much do you think it really affects them? Not one bit. They probably hadn't lost a lick of sleep about it. Honestly, truthfully, they probably don't even know you're mad with them. If you get down and boil it down all the way to, they probably don't even know you're upset with them. And so the fact that you haven't forgiven someone has not affected them at all. How much then has it affected you? You see, the lack of forgiveness has a greater effect on you than it does on the person that you have failed to forgive. It hasn't affected them at all, but it's affected you. And in what ways? The Bible commands us to affect our brothers, or, or excuse me, to forgive our brothers. Not just a brother, and I use that term loosely, but to forgive everyone. To forgive, to forgive all people, to forgive everyone who would do something offensive to us, who would offend us in some way, to forgive them. So why does the Bible tell us that? One, I want to put it to you, and, and you know, I, I don't know how this will work out, just follow the Lord as it works out. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7 tells us that we need to be careful about what we do in, in a situation between a husband and a wife because even the relationship between a husband and a wife, a lack of forgiveness in a relationship between a husband and a wife can affect your prayers. If that can affect your prayers, in a, even a situation, an argument between a husband and a wife can affect your prayer life, what can unforgiveness do in a relationship with a, a, a church brother, how can that affect your prayer life? In other words, it affects us. Jesus commands us to forgive in Matthew chapter 18. In fact, 70 times 7, he says. Not that there would be a limitation to our forgiveness, but our forgiveness should be without limitation is exactly what he's saying. That we should forgive in every opportunity, in every way we should be forgiving. When you look at the scope of humanity, God's people should be the most forgiving group of people that there is. How many times do we harbor things in our heart at church and in church matters 
that affect our brothers and sisters, that, that, that affect our relationship. There's nobody in this building that's perfect. And there's nobody that comes in here that's going to be. So don't expect that. I grew up in my family with two brothers that drove me crazy. And they still some ways about them that gets under my skin. I don't expect them to be perfect. But I forgive them. You know why? Because I love them. And more than I forgive them for themselves, I have to forgive them for me. What's it going to do to me if I don't forgive them? All right, so I, want to, I want to kind of focus on that. First John chapter 1 tells us that sin hinders us. And that what we are to do is to be minded like the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to forgive. All right, so let me ask this question. Under what circumstances are we to forgive biblically? And the reason I'm asking these questions because I want to address it from that perspective because we, we often look at it from that perspective. One, that our forgiveness should be the number of times should be without limitation, okay? So if we're to forgive in every situation without limitation, no matter how many times a person comes to us, what then are the circumstances where we are justified to not forgive somebody? Can somebody come up with one scenario, with one circumstance, biblically, where we are justified to not forgive someone? Anybody got anything? So then what does that tell us? That regardless of what anybody has ever done to you, you are to forgive them. No matter how tough, no matter how rough, no matter how bad, you are instructed to forgive them. There are no circumstances that limit the forgiveness that we are to have to one another and to all humanity. We are to be forgiven because God is forgiven. Some of the mentioned some of the consequences of forgiveness here in just a moment. But the Bible often and especially in you begin to read the Gospels, you begin to read the teachings of Christ, the words in red and all of that business. You, you begin to see Jesus quite a few times talks about the idea that he and that the Lord forgives as we forgive. Chew on that for a moment. So if we seek and we are to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and our goal is to be in a relationship with Him and to be close to Christ and yet we are harboring unforgiveness, we're harboring something that we're holding on to and that we, we haven't let go has He done the same? Now, oftentimes what people want to do is they want to take that and they want to go to, they want to go to salvation. They say, well, if, if you don't forgive somebody, then you, you know, you, you, some kind of not saved, that kind of, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about forgiveness in the sense of a relationship. That if you don't forgive others, then he's not going to forgive you. In other words, that your lack of forgiveness has hindered your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that you're not to a place where you can properly seek forgiveness from the Lord because you haven't forgiven others as you should. We should never be ones to hold grudge. Not because it's out of character, though it is. Not just because... It, it, it can cause tough situations and can, can, can make situations very tense and, and often worse, but because of how it's going to affect you. It's going to destroy your spirituality. It's going to destroy your prayer life. 
Don't hold a grudge because it'll tear up your relationship with the Lord. Let me give you some other things that it's going to do. Consequences of not forgiving. It's going to produce bitterness in you. Because a lack of forgiveness, a grudge, will cause you to become bitter. And there is nothing, what is the, there is nothing more deterring to the world than bitterness. You find bitterness, look, God's people are riddled with bitterness today. Shouldn't be the case. Everybody look, look, look in their own heart. I don't know the case of any of it. But when the world comes to us and they find a child of God who is bitter, y'all ever eat anything bitter? We went to the doctor and they told us one of the things they instruct us to do is drink apple cider vinegar. I can't even smell vinegar. When they gave the Lord vinegar to drink, it's just like, you know, man. I have learned to tolerate it. That's about as far as I can get. Much less enjoy it, you know. It's a natural, the point is this, it's a natural response to reject bitterness. Get it away from me. I don't want anything to do with it. From a taste. And that's what the Bible is portraying. When a person becomes bitter, a child of God becomes bitter, it's automatically, it's our nature. Get them away from me. I don't want to be around them. Why? Because they're bitter. And when they become bitter, it affects everybody else around them. And so sometimes if we're not careful, we can find ourselves where we haven't forgiven somebody. We're holding a grudge. We've become bitter. And then we're looking at our family. We're like, What's going on here? Well, you've been bitter for years. Nobody wants to be around you. All because of this thing that you've been holding on to for such a long time. Let go of it and move on. Forgive them. Not for their sake. Not only for their sake, but certainly that they could come and maybe they could see the error of their ways if they're wrong and they could be right with the Lord, but for your sake. Because look what it's doing to you. Bitterness has, dist- it has done so much damage to our churches because people have held on to things that they should have let go of. Because when people should have been forgiving They've sought for justice that they haven't even stopped to take a look in the mirror. We're all imperfect. And if they need forgiveness, then we need forgiveness too. Because we've failed. And we've come short of the glory of God. And so the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 that we're to seek peace. We're to follow after peace. And the Bible goes on to use Esau as an example. And it even makes the statement in Hebrews chapter 12 there, lest any root of bitterness springing up and thereby many be defiled. It's amazing how a root of bitterness in a church can defile many. One root of bitterness. So it's important for us to forgive one another. But often what we find ourselves doing is tolerating one another and that shouldn't be the case we should be loving one another we should enjoy the presence of one another and we should forgive one another again how does uh, uh, unforgive think for a moment uh, of the prodigal son's brother the attitude that he had I don't believe the prodigal son's brother was willing to forgive his brother who had come home and although the father had forgiven him for the mistakes that he made, and the father had allowed, and, and it shows us the, the love that the father had for that son. And yet the brother's over there feeling sorry for himself. And I think oftentimes we can find ourselves relating to the brother. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves that very same attitude. And today you say, well, I, I've been wronged. 
Maybe you have. Say, I've been done dirty. Maybe you have. I don't know. Maybe it's been something that's pretty rough. Maybe it's something that what the person did to you could put them in prison for years. But all it's going to do is cause you to become bitter if you don't forgive them. So forgive them. We should learn to forgive like Stephen. That even when a person's seeking to kill us, take our life from us, that we'd be willing to forgive. The Bible never puts a limitation on how forgiving we are to be because there is no limit to it. Our forgiveness should extend to the same forgiveness of Jesus Christ because we have his character in us. And we are of his spirit. And today we're to forgive like that. We're to forgive like Jesus has forgiven us. And we are to forgive. If you really take a moment to study yourself, and to ask the question, what if Christ didn't forgive me? Tonight, for just a moment, who is it that you've harbored a grudge for? Or a mistake that you've held on to? Tonight, forgive them. Not just for their sake, but for yours. That a root of bitterness not spring up and many be defiled here while we have a verse of a song.